Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to St. Lucas, Brussels. If you're not a student here, uh, you're visiting for the first time, a special welcome. Uh, my name is Nicolas Sedari. I am the uh, head of visual arts uh, here at St. Lucas and also the head of our uh, research unit, uh, Intermedia. Um, it's a very special day for us here at St. Lucas. We're welcoming uh, probably among the most well-known contemporary artists of our, of our time, uh, Gilbert and George. They're here with us, just close by, so no worries. Uh, they'll uh, be replacing me and Johanna in, uh, in a moment, together with, uh, with Sam Stavely, the uh, art critic and, and journalist. Um, I'm very uh, grateful, uh, well, first of all, to all of you for being here for this special event, and of course to the artists who have very generously accepted our invitation. As uh, probably many of you already know, they have an exhibition this afternoon, at opening this afternoon at 6 at Gallery Albert Barognon. So everyone is also invited to join uh, later today um, for, that, uh, for that moment. So I'd also like to thank uh, Albert Barognon personally, who is here with us, um, for having uh, made this uh, made this event uh, possible. The title of the exhibition at the gallery is The Beard Pictures. Um, I have to also make a special thanks to the fine arts team here uh, at St. Lucas, uh, in particular uh, Helmut Stella, who is also here uh, in, in the front, who actually uh, a few months ago, not so long ago, <laughs> say a month and a half or two maximum, uh, whispered the idea, why don't we invite Gilbert and George uh, to come to our school, and I at first said, oh, it's going to be too difficult, we're not ready for something like that. But patiently, he came back to me a second time, insisted, and then I said, okay, let's go for it. And there were reasons to hesitate, but I think those reasons have been fully overcome, and seeing you so many this afternoon uh, makes it particularly uh, so the case. Um, together with him, at the, he's one of his co-conspirators in the Fine Arts Department, uh, Frank Castellanes, um, Chris Bleskauer, uh, Sophie Nays, who have also been uh, contributing uh, to very many practical things in making uh, today uh, possible. Uh, together with them, I'd like to also thank our technical team, the so-called pool here at, uh, on campus, Jan Pilat, Joachim Mert, uh, Paul Van Roy, um, uh, who else, who else? Luke Comperno, who's filming uh, and is going to also um, broadcast for those who are outside the, um, the event. I'm almost finished. Uh, I'd also like to thank our new production officer, Kim Godus. I don't know if Kim is here somewhere. There she is. We've been doing an amazing job in, uh, in making this all possible. And next to me, Joanna Kint, uh, our uh, standing, sorry, I'm not going to get this, our standing senior art historian on campus uh, for the moment. Uh, so she will be doing a very uh, quick and short introduction to our guests, just to uh, give a sense of, uh, of who is uh, joining us um, this afternoon. And finally, a couple of announcements that I do now and not at the end, so we can finish the, uh, the day in a more artistic way. Uh, those announcements involve a symposium uh, that we are organizing as uh, uh, Visual Arts St. Lucas. It's currently, actually it took place yesterday at the Venice Biennale, and it's taking place tomorrow in Leuven. It's called Picture Presence, New Conceptions of uh, photography, um, in, co in contemporary photography, and that is a two-day symposium. Everybody is invited tomorrow in Leuven at the M Museum if you're interested in continuing uh, reflection on photography and contemporary art. That is an interesting uh, rendezvous. And finally, next week, the opening of our show research program here at the gallery on Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m. Everyone is, of course, invited, and there will be Madnik Srumans, one of our researchers on campus, doing a presentation. Again, thank you all uh, for being here, and Joanna, I give you the floor for your introduction. Yes. Good afternoon. My presentation will be very short because people already mentioned my turnout of it. But I would like to say that it is my pleasure to welcome you um, to the artist talk by Gilbert and George within the context of the exhibition that is called The Beard Pictures at the Albert Baronian Gallery, showing a new series of portraits. And this exhibition will go on, will run till the 23rd of December. So you still have plenty of time to take a close look at this exhibition. We are very pleased to welcome the artists at the Lucas School of Arts, uh, as well as Sam Stavelink, uh, who will moderate uh, the talk. And we also would like to express our 
a gratitude to Mr. Carmignon uh, for making this event possible. Um, the artist duo Gilbert and George placed themselves, their thoughts, feelings at the center of their work. Gilbert and George, as you have been reading, uh, met as students at the sculpture course at the St. Martin School of Art in London, and soon they began to create art together. Uh, they adopted the identity of living sculptures uh, in both their art and their daily lives. They become creators and the art itself. So I think it's very important to uh, focus on that aspect. Um, they have done many solo shows and retros retrospectives around the world. Um, they made several early pictures and videos that captured the idyllic rural imagery. Drinking was also a major theme in their work. I remember the video work, Gordon makes us very drunk. Around 1974, they began to order their photographic work in rectangular grids. And the use of these rectangular grids and the format of these grids is a format that they are still developing until the present. Another aspect that also is quite important is that no longer do they work in black and white, but also the introduction of color. In the late 70s, they created the dirty word pictures, and some of them are on show at the Herbert Foundation in Ghent showing graffiti tags photographed in the streets. The brutality of the language captures the social discontent of London at that specific time. In the 1980s, their pictures became bigger, brighter, bolder, and often playful. From 2000 on, they began to design their pictures using digital technology. The work of Gilbert and George is not only a portrait of the city uh, in which they live, but it is also, and I would like to emphasize that aspect very much, it's also a reflection on human condition. In their work, they have confronted many of the fundamental issues of existence, sex, religion, corruption, violence, hope, fear, racial tension, addiction, and death. In 1969, they formulated their principles in a manifesto which was entitled The Laws of Sculptors. One, always be smartly dressed, well groomed, relaxed, friendly, polite, and in complete control. <laughs> Second, Make the world believe in you and to pay heavily for this privilege. Third, never worry, <laughs> assess, discuss, or criticize, but remain quiet, respectful, and calm. Four, the Lord chisels still, so don't leave your bench for long. We can go on talking about these provocative well-known artists, but we prefer to let them do the talking. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Joanna, Nicola, and of course, um, Gilbert and George. It's an honor having you here. It's also a special year, as you met exactly 50 years ago. Um, do you remember the first time you met, uh, and how did that go along? I'm worried that people can't hear us. Can you all hear us right? Very good. I think we met at St. Martin's School of Art because of a lot of bad luck. We always believe that bad luck leads to good luck. So after a succession of different places in the world, we ended up together by some extraordinary chance in the middle of what was the permissive society. It was swinging London. It was anything goes. So we were very excited and very privileged. And we, and I came from the Dolomite, where we speak a Loretto-Romanish language in very, very slow, I moved towards the north. 
First I went to Austria, then I went to Munich, then I saw that is not good enough, so I have to go to the moon, and that was London those days. And after that, after walking up to the top of St. Martin's School of Art, there was one room where, where it was the freest room in the world for being an artist at that time. And we were a group of maybe 10 young students. There, George was, uh, George was there, and he took an interest in me. Ooh. <laughs> and, and the rest is history, of course. Um, in 1969, you started making living sculptures, basically. Um, is it true that the idea, idea came from kind of a Christmas uh, crib, or where did you get the idea from? We think the living sculpture came about because of circumstances. Unlike most art students, we didn't come from the middle classes. So we were poor, and we didn't have the safety net of family. And most students have a part-time teaching job, which wouldn't be available to two people. Most people got a good bank and grant, which again wouldn't be a possible for two people, or they would have a, a year in Rome. Uh, n none of those things were available to us. So when we left college, we stopped being art students and we were there alone in the world with nothing. And we felt in that moment that we were overtaken, like a change in the weather, that everything like a cloud descended on us. And we became adults and artists. Although we were poor and we had nothing, we felt very assured and filled with belief and hope. It was quite interesting because whilst you are in an art school, you, are, you, ha you have a safety net. But once they shut you out, you, you are outside in the street with nothing, then it's a totally new world starts for you. You have to, how do you become an artist with nothing? And I remember that those days we used to make some kind of object that you can hold, like a bowl or a square or a stick. You know? And somebody was taking a photograph of us to holding this object. And halfway through, we realized we don't need objects. We are the art. You know? We are the speaking artist. We are the speaking sculpture. And then we started to walk the streets of London day and night without, an, uh, without a studio. And that's when we became the living sculptors. And we are still that. We are still going towards the end. And you also made a dinner sculpture, which is basically a sculpture for which people paid money to watch you eat. Uh, you did a singing sculpture, walking sculpture, and then one of my favorites, the drinking sculpture. However, you don't really feel affiliated with performance art. How come? We, we never use the, the dreaded P word. We don't like the P word. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the other dreaded P word. <laughs> no, no, we always said living sculpture because we believe that performance art is a form that alienates less educated people. Nobody wants to take their grandmother to a performance art. <coughs> and living sculpture is more real, it's more democratic. I mean, it was at the beginning that we started to find our way, so we were experimenting in different ways, you know, like we, what you call, we did the, the, the dinner, you know, the, the meal, that are uh, very interesting because we walked into a gallery, one, what you call, in 68 to 69, and it was the Caspian Gallery in London. And we said, would you like to be a guest of our dinner you know, to Caspian? And said, no, not me. But why don't you ask that person over there? And that was David Hockney. <laughs> and he said, yes. But that was, not, that was only experimental art in some way. It was not the beginning. And then we did the postal sculpture that you, we used to send out to different people, like 300 guests, you know, with a mailing list that we got from I remember Conrad Fisher in Düsseldorf, and it was extraordinary success. We, are ab we were able to penetrate what they call into the, into the houses of the collectors yeah. or the artistic people. So in fact, it was just experimenting because we didn't leave the art school and run and buy some canvases or, or get a subsidized studio and start making sculptures again. We wanted to start fresh because unlike most of our contemporary teachers and students. We felt we had something new to say, and we wanted to find a new way to say it. And we wanted the form to be subservient to the meaning. And we had to, f we, we make pictures now, but they're pictures not from people who are trained to be picture makers, they're pictures by sculptors. We had to find our way to make the pictures that would speak 
in our way, our own particular way. In fact, it was a different way of making or to, of going towards art because we didn't like the idea of formalism, that what only form, <coughs> forms meant art. We had this idea that only the human person, that's the center of a vision for an artist. No? We want to make an art that is painful, that is happy, that you are able to be drunk, you are able to be unhappy, that is human. It has to be a human art. And that was very difficult those days, because at that time it was the, the age of minimal art, or what you call, don't express yourself too much, make it all invisible in some way. And we did this exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. All, all of the content that we wanted to put into our form, they were all subjects that were taboo in the four or five galleries in the world where we could be represented. It was a very small art world. There was one in London, one in Paris, one in Brussels, one in New York, a tiny family of modern art. And they were, the whole thing was against what we believed in. So we were at that time, we were on the periphery of the art world, but we stayed still and continued, so we came, became more central because of the movement of the art world. And so you often uh, feature yourself in your works, which you're also doing in a brand new series uh, shown here in Brussels at Baronian Gallery. Uh, the series is called The Beard Pictures. Um, so you basically feature yourself in various constellations with beards intertwined, forming uh, trees, um, cups, uh, bridges. So where did you get the idea from to work around beards uh, for this series? Uh, <coughs> because we are, the, it's our journey towards life, no? And, uh, and what we confront in, us, in front of us, that's what we are doing. What interests us, no? That's what exactly what we are doing, without looking at art. We never looked at art, but for the last 30 years, we never went near a gallery or a, or a museum, because we believe very much that if you want to do something new, you have to be naked in front of the world. Nothing. You don't need a baggage of art behind you. So, like, Recently, we started to see all over Europe and the world what they call fences going up, barbed wire fences going up, walls going up, and we started to see holes in the in the fences, and we started to see people with beards looking through the, that. And at the same time, we went to dinner in the evening, and we started to see all the hipsters. No? Yeah. So we realized that we had these religious beards and non-religious beards, you know, in and out of the fence. So it's and a reflection like, of our times, basically. Like, like every subject that we try to tackle or embrace, it's always very, very simple and very complicated. So in a simple way, for instance, when we were teenagers, you wouldn't get a job if you had a beard. But if you're a teenager now in the East London, you wouldn't get a job if you don't have a beard. And with barbed wire, when we were children or teenagers, barbed wire meant farming. Now, it means more than that. So we're always trying to fascinate, to find the fabric of our world in order to form our tomorrows. <clears throat> we don't want to show life or reflect life. We want to make pictures which will make a little difference to our world. We, we know that London and the world is a totally different place from when we were baby artists, extraordinarily different. And that's all been arranged by people involved in culture, di directing governments. And we want to be part of that. We want to be part of the tomorrow of a better world. And halfway through doing these beard pictures, because we started uh, what they call two and a half years ago, first we took the images that interest us. No? We always take images, like maybe before doing a, a new group of pictures, we take like maybe 10,000 images. And we put them in, we group them in, in subjects. And then uh, Christmas Day and two years ago, we opened all these contact sheets because we have them on big tables, and we started to see two leaves that looked like beards. And that's how it started. You, you can hide yourself behind a beard, or you have a religious beard. And then we were able, halfway through making the speech, to turn them into bridges, you know, a bridge to go to, toward the other side. Or we turn them into a key to open the door or we turn them into a gate that can open up that you can walk through, because we all need gates to go through in some way or another. So that's fascinating for us. And can you again, it's very, again it's a, that exact situation is very simple and very complex. The, they were just two leaves. <coughs> they came from a neighboring tree. That every autumn, the leaves from the neighbor's tree come into our backyard, and we see them, and they are mulberry leaves. 
because our district, Fournier Street, was where the Huguenot people who were chucked out of France for being Protestants came, and they needed mulberry leaves for the silkworms. So out of simplicity is an extraordinary history of religion and oppression and movements of people. Very complicated, but in the end, very simple, just two leaves being beards. Uh, can you tell something more maybe about the way these works are made so they are very big, colorful uh, pictures, which also have a grid structure, which almost remind one of, uh, we could say, profane glass-stained windows. Why do you always work with the grid structure? And ah. We, are, we don't like stained glass window. Even we think it's fantastic art, you know, like medieval uh, stained glass windows are extraordinary. They tell an amazing story. But we didn't do it for that. We did it because we used the new material to make our picture. That was what called, we stopped making drawings because drawings reminded us too much of art. And we didn't like the, what they call the, the artistic hand. We didn't like that. So we tried to remove that. And so we used the, what they call the, the image, the frozen image in the camera to freeze, to freeze time. And so we started to make a pictures with negatives and photographs. But we didn't know how to make a big composition mm -hmm. at that time, because nobody did that before. Yes. So very, very slow. It took three or four years to put them together into a, what you call, a frame, a rectangular frame. And, but, and then we didn't know how to protect them. You know? If you don't have glass or pears in front of it, everybody can go up and scratch them. You know? So that's why we arranged a grid. And the grid was the biggest photo paper that you can buy at that time, cut, 50 by 60. And that's why we kept to that, because it's very easy to, to protect an artwork, it's very easy to transport an artwork, it's very easy to install an artwork, and that's it. That's why, it's, that's the reason. But later became a very interesting reason to make a composition through that. And we like it because it's very like life. It's like a house. You cannot have a house with one brick. Or like time, we need minutes and weeks and years. It's a normal arrangement to divide things into parts. And a lot of um, artists of your caliber, um, they have a lot of assistants. I think Jeff Koons, a given moment, used to have around 100 assistants. Olaf Eliasson has 90. I think it's not really the case with you. How many assistants do you have, if you have any? We have one helper, that is you again. He is here. <laughs> St so stand up, you again, please. Stand up, you again. <laughs> the one and only. A round of applause for you again, please. <laughs> Yu Gang is a magic man because magic we, we, man, we, yes. met, we met him in Shanghai <laughs> when we had a huge exhibition there and he very politely and very gently followed us slowly back to London. <laughs> so, so we were the opposite of Shanghai. <laughs> we were Shanghai in reverse. And, uh, and if He's not very good. He, he does all of the things that we don't like doing and we we'd all, it's, it's exactly right. It's like the, the little uh, nursery rhyme. Jack Spratt could eat no fat his wife could eat no lean, and so between them both, they licked the platter clean. <laughs> this, it's not exactly the relationship, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's Sounds very it interesting because all what is art we do, that's it. But so you don't feel like outsourcing, you, you prefer really being in control yourselves? Like, you we know. don't understand how can you could make an artwork with another person. We never did that. It's a very ever. private private activity for us. Yeah. Very emotional and very private. And we are we never needed a system. We have our framer and our mounter, that's outside. But even the frame were designed by us, the boxes were designed by us, everything designed by us. But we make the artwork. We take the images. Everything image that we use was taken by us. The actual the actual process of designing the pictures coming up with the designs, which are always in miniature, they're 10% of the final pictures, is a period of a very, very intense emotional feeling. It's, it's a little bit like if you're very strongly attached or attracted emotionally or sexually to another person, that everything seems improved in life. It's like a high, in a way. You feel slightly elevated. And creating the pictures is extraordinary magic feeling, going through the day until... We stop. At, we get up at five o'clock. We have breakfast at seven. We buy a newspaper. We go into the studio. We don't know what we're going to do. We never go with ideas or plans. We like to go dead-headed, zonked, we call it, blind and deaf. 
And how we are, how we are that year or that month or that moment is how the pictures will be. We drag them out from inside of ourselves. And that's an extraordinary, rewarding, magic feeling. We, we come down to the studio the day after and it would be impossible for us to reconstruct how we came about and arrived at that design. It's all a wonderful, magical, mystery thing, and we love it. It's all done in a black room. It's all in, that ra in the dark room that we're doing it. But as so, we have the, so we have the, the, pri the privilege of going to the studio and making whatever pictures we want. We don't have to check with anyone or refer to anyone. No one can interfere, no authority, no one. And that's an enormous privilege, that freedom to create whatever pictures we want. And this, the second privilege is to be able to take those pictures out into the world, to Brussels today, to another city tomorrow. And again, no one can see, we can hang exactly which pictures we want in the museum or in the gallery. That's an enormous privilege. And the, the bonus that comes with those two privileges is the private view, which will be tomorrow night or tonight, is it? Tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. tonight. We had one, one last night for special people. So the pictures are on the wall, the lighting has been done, the catalogues printed, the invitations <coughs> card's gone out, and there we are at the private view, very proud, very happy, with a glass of wine in one hand, surrounded by teenagers licking us all over. <laughs> <laughs> That's art for us, yes. <laughs> but uh, it's very interesting, even not only do we all the, pic uh, what the pictures, we do all the invitation cards, we do the, all the installations, <laughs> and we do all the catalog. Every catalog is designed by us. Yeah, yeah. It's total artwork, everything, from the beginning to the end. But so returning to the, the way you make your work, it's, it's a routine is very important. Eh? You said you get up at six, then you work, then if I'm not mistaken, you watch Miss Marple, you go for a walk, you go every day to the same Kurdish restaurant before you used to go to a Chinese one. So this kind of routine is very creative for you in a way. No, we, need, we need to be very orderly and very controlled in, o in order to be strange. We always say we don't want to be normal because everyone's normal. We don't want to be weird because all the artists are a bit weird. We want to be normal and weird at, at the, the same, same time. time. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and that gives us an amazing freedom that leaves our heads completely yeah. empty. But the to, whole to create, you have to have an empty head. But the whole structure is based on what we are doing. We have a period where we take the images. We have a period when we do the designs. We have a period when we make them one-to-one. -one. We have a period when we do the uh, catalogs and the installation. So it's all divided into different periods. And yes, but we are very organized, extremely organized, because then we are totally free to do what we want. We, we know exactly where everything is. And if I'm not mistaken, your previous show here in Brussels at Baronia, you were showing basically the London pictures for which you used uh, headlines from those kind of tabloids, uh, which are very big in England. Um, I know it's always tricky to ask to talk about politics, but let's try it anyway. These tabloids were quite important for the Brexit. Uh, how do you relate to this entire Brexit story and what's your position mm. in that? I think the, the, the tabloids were all the time, they were going back to 1920s, mm -hmm. all these signs every day. Not, not that they were tabloid newspapers, they weren't the Sun or the Mirror. They were, they were Evening Standard. Evening Standard, standard. and local yeah. newspapers. It was to do with sex and politics and bombs. They were. And, and co contrary to the press's opinion of those pictures, they were very, they weren't sensational headlines. They were stating simple facts. Yeah. Woman mugged on tube. Teenager dies in car crash. N none of them were exploitative. Mm -hmm. Not at all, in fact. But, but we like those pictures. Can because we they can are pour some water? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. But um, basically, returning to this Brexit question, which you kind of try to avoid, um, wh what's your point of view on Brexit? Gonna hide, a, uh, hide away Brexit. from that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've always been involved in Europe from the very first day. We le left college and we immediately showed in, in Dusseldorf, and then, we showed, then we showed in, in Italy, then and in uh, all around. And then there was a magic night in Brussels in 1970 or late 69 and we were at a, what we would now call a pop-up gallery in the Avenue Louise. I think it was a dress shop. It had been requisitioned by a man called Herman Dullett, and he invited artists to do special events or something. Yeah? And he invited us to present the singing sculpture there, which we did. It was a dreary, cold, wet evening, and not a very 
auspicious event at all. But at the end of the evening, a little, what we thought was a little old lady, she's much younger than we are now, came up to us and in this wonderful Central European accent said, my name is Ileana Sonnebend. I'm opening a gallery in New York and I want you to do the opening exhibition, which was an invitation that every living artist would die for at that time. So it was extraordinary. But we feel very much that art is not European, it's global. From the first day we, made, we did exhibition, we were always in a global world. You know, we did all the gold. we went to Australia, to America, to China, to all, it's global. It's not like this little Europe that is trying to build, build walls for themselves that were not allowed in or out in some way. No, no, in or out. It's not global, it's only what they call it's only for certain people. It's not for everybody. Even the freedom of movement is only for the people who are inside that group. If you are outside that, you have a big problem to move in. So we don't, we don't believe in that so much. There's, there's no one more European than where we live in London. Our street is called Fournier Street because of the, of the Huguenots. The, the, the land was a, a, a Roman, a place where Romans were living. It was a Roman district. Uh, it's extraordinary. The whole, the whole district. We have a mosque at one end of the street. We have a, a synagogue down the other end of the street. It's, it's people from all over. It's, it's not very London where we live, in fact. Yes. It's very, very, it's very, very global and very, very European. And, uh, and England never believed in the greater Europe. Never. They only like, they like commerce, but they don't we want to be part of a greater united state of Europe. Never wanted that. I think that's... The, that's where the problem lies. I think ever-increasing integration is a very old-fashioned idea. Anyway, to, to, you, move, to move on. And to we move realize on more and more that we always used to ask, who is the pre uh, president of uh, what you call Lisb in Portugal? Portugal, nobody knows. Who is the president of Spain? They know it now a little because of the problem. Who is the president of Italy? Nobody knows. Greece, what you call uh, Sweden, nobody knows. They only know one name, Angela Merkel. So that's not so that's not very European. Yeah. So I think like we could say from a political point of view, you're probably rather conservative, yet morally you're very rebellious. Maybe this is pushing it a bit, but I was wondering. And we are conservative like uh, ordinary families always were. Yeah, My yeah, family yeah. were always conservative. And your family always we, we, conservative. We think conservative is normal. We, uh, the art world is of course relentlessly so social the left, the art world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we never we never felt that we wanted to join that club. We don't understand that the world which is to do with originality, you know, fashion, fine art, music, pop music, that's a world where originality is the key. You have to be original if you want to design something or paint a picture. Why is it they all have the same political view? That seems very strange to us. Mm -hmm. We you, want you, to anyway, be outsiders. We, that's yeah, very yeah. simple. We never want to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big reason for us. We never want to be part of anything. We never want to be part of going every night to see all the artists together and have a drink. We are outsiders. Even we never are part of the establishment of art in London, even when we had all the big exhibitions, but we are still not yeah. part of it. We are outsiders and we want to be there because we want to be free to think whatever we want. Yeah. We have, we have been under attack just for being conservative because the, the socialist artists in that community is very intolerant. If you don't believe what they believe, you're wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a famous quote by Oscar Wilde. I mean, there are quite a lot of famous quotes by Oscar Wilde. But one goes like, uh, I put all my genius into my life and I put all my talent into my work. What do you think about this quote? And do you feel it's relating? Oh, we love we're Oscar Wilde. We're, yeah. we're great admirers, yes. But no, we did, we, we did believe that we combined our art with our life from the first day. And that's because we had the idea of, we had the idea of art for all. Because we felt that St. Martin's School of Art was creating a kind of art that eliminated 92% of the world's population. That it would only be understood in certain galleries in London, Paris, and New York. And we felt that was incredibly restrictive and incredible cruel denial of the life of individuals all over the world. So and we set out to try to make an art that could be understood with people of different religious backgrounds, different educational backgrounds, that it could speak in some way to people in general, not just to the elitist few. Art for all. Yes, it's very, the art has to speak. It has to be powerful and it has to speak. And it has to be visually very powerful, 
but we need to have what we call, we have to show our vision of the world. No? And they are allowed to say yes or no. And, but it is an, uh, a vision that is not part of an art vision, it's a part of uh, what we call the journey towards the end. What did we confront, like sexuality or, or racism or people different than all what is in front of us? We are dealing with those subjects. They are nothing to do with art, they are part of humanity. Generally, uh, generally speaking, an artist has a, a development of his style, so it changes throughout his career. And we feel we don't have that. We have the development, the evolution of a person's life. So you were children once, then you're teenagers, then you fall in love, then you go to college, then you get more, it's like a, a, a normal person's life through art. That's why in the early days, we had a problem. For, for, we remember a very good story. We had a beautiful exhibition in Dusseldorf as, as baby artists. And it was a wonderful evening, the private view. I think we even sold two pictures. It was very exciting. And we all went and had dinner, and we all got drunk and went home. And the next day, we came into the gallery, and there was a lady sweeping up the bottle tops and the cigarette ends. And the dealer was sitting at his desk, looking very grumpy and very glum. <coughs> we said, what is the matter? Do you have a hangover or something? He said, no, ooh, really, ill-tempered and grumpy. We said, come on, tell us, what's the problem? He said, ooh, the cleaning woman, she likes your exhibition. <laughs> and that's, that's how it was in the 70s. Art had to be something that a normal person wouldn't get, and then it was good. And we think that's wrong and stupid. Um, maybe to finish off, um, some years ago you told me that you, when you cross the street, you cross it simultaneously in case that you get run over <laughs> by a car. At no, least but that's a, <coughs> a very funny story. You know, that's a funny story. Because in German, the, 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 great, the, great, the great German question, which is, what happens in one of you dies? <laughs> I was just going to ask so that, uh, I guess I'll skip it. <laughs> and, and we always reply, fear not, we always cross the road together. <laughs> but then, uh, basically, talking about posterity, I just heard you're going to open a venue in a couple of years, a foundation. Yes, we have a foundation. We are, uh, two minutes from where we live, we are going to open a foundation because these days it's very difficult to have sh ex uh, artworks in museums mm -hmm. because there are too many artists. So if you want to show the world your art, you have to do your own museum. So we'll That's what we are doing. That Gilbert and George display. No, we can show even other people. If but the idea to. is to show our art, the so leftovers. We, so we, we found a, them. we found a very beautiful small building with a very beautiful garden. It's, it's like the magical it's secret magic garden, garden that everyone has in the back of their minds. And we we plan to restore the building and to have it. We, we've designed the gates for it. And y young people say, why, why are you doing that? We say, we do it because we want to be immoral. And they say, don't you mean immortal? We say, that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering, as we're in an art school, there's a lot of uh, art, struggling art students here, or artists in the room. Is there maybe kind of a word of advice you would talk We have them? a lot of advice, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we only have our standard stock reply to that question because we always say that it's, it's not unlike ourselves in a way that tomorrow morning when you wake up, sit on the edge of the bed, don't stand up, keep your eyes closed and think, what do I want to say to the world today? <laughs> and don't open the eyes and get up and start doing something until you've decided. And in that moment, it doesn't matter whether it's a pencil or a brush or a typewriter, you, you know where you're going. And the second equally important piece of advice to the same students is, Fuck the teachers. <laughs> um, are maybe people the teachers are clapping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seem to agree. Are there maybe people in the audience who would like to ask yes. a question to, yeah. to the artists? If there are questions, we'd be very happy to. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, do you ever take in an intern? Do you work with interns? Sorry? No, we, we never had interns, I didn't think. No, no, no we only never. have one Chinese gentleman. <laughs> 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 so yes, we don't so want people in our studio because they would tell us what to do. <laughs> we know that. They're especially, that's why we don't English people. They immediately would tell you they don't like this one, they don't like that one, or they like that one. Yeah. And we don't want that. They, c they can do all of that once the pictures are finished on the wall. Once they're finished, because we never let people near our pictures until they are finished. Including the galleries? Even the galleries. We never, the galleries never know what we're doing. Until it's too late. <laughs> <laughs>
that's quite important, that you are a free person in front of the gallery even. Freedom, the great cry, everybody in the world wants freedom. Is there someone else you would like to ask? Maybe. We okay. Nice and loud, please. Um, you were talking about how in the late 60s when you started making work and you were exhibiting with Conrad Fisher and it seemed like a, and you said it was swinging, London was swinging. Um, do you think that the world, the art world in general, has become more conservative in the last 50 years and that it's becoming harder to uh, be experimental or to, it's become more rigid, the boundaries of how you define yourself, more professionalized perhaps? No, I would say that the world, art world expanded enormously in our time, in the last few. Unbelievable, when we were baby artists, there were only three galleries in London, all of which never showed English artists anywhere. Now there are museums in cities all over the world. It's extraordinary. There are millions and millions of artists from, uh, there are African artists, Indonesian artists. No, we art, you, yeah. art used to be a European, North American thing, very restricted. No, that's quite different now. We really believe there's an extraordinary way because art is global now. It didn't used to be. It used to be like, what it called Europe and America in some way, no, and that's it. And now art is con could come from anywhere in some way, and that's a new freedom. Maybe, we, maybe they are too politically correct, we feel. They are all becoming vegetarians. And <laughs> <laughs> we, call, we call them vaginatarians to tease them. No, for, for years we were stopped on our local high street by people who would say, I am concept artist from Bulgaria. <laughs> and now it's different. They say, I am curator from Lithuania. <laughs> it's all curators suddenly. They're oh. all curators. But we never let anybody curate our shows. Any other question? Uh, maybe last question and then we... Yes, of course. Uh, more? There's more time? Okay. Yes. In, uh, in what sense, um, did, uh, if you were in art school, uh, like uh, the New York scene and the Warhol, the real, uh, uh, in, in what sense did it have uh, an influence on your thoughts and your minds and uh, like also the other students? Was it already much there or was it only later that it came? I think that's very simple. When we were baby art students, I was in the, in the west of England was in the north of Europe. I think the general idea was that you could only be an artist if you came from a wine-growing country. It's extraordinary. It was, it was a real prejudice. It had to be a warm climate so you could have a naked lady on a coach. Yeah? And then later on, it, you had to be an artist. If you had to be an artist, it had to be from North America. And now it's much more general. You can be an artist from anywhere in the world. And we made a very big point that we want to stick our legs in, in the mud in London and nothing else. You know. We want to, to be free to be ourselves without looking at, at other art. I mean, we met artists, you know. but we never wanted to be, we never wanted the idea of the influence looking at other artists. We never want that. And I think that's a fantastic idea. <laughs> yeah, but th there is a, a big difference uh, between the, let's say, the abstract painting and then Andy Warhol who came with the, the real things. And then you are also... I think figu figu fig yeah. fig figurative and abstract is very simple. We had a, a Bangladeshi young friend who became very jealous of us because he, he said, I would like to be an artist, but I cannot be an artist because I am a Muslim. And we knew the answer to that, but we pretended we didn't know. He said, because if I draw a tree, I'm killing the tree. Islam doesn't allow figuration, yeah? So he said, well, if you really want to become an artist, it's very easy. You can become an abstract artist. And he said, yes, but that would be very boring. <laughs> but I mean, we made it into a personal art. I think that's the difference. The other one, uh, that's uh, personal. And that's different from other artists. And even we created a language how to speak that is ours. Mm. That's very important. That is ours. I, I know somebody who came to drink tea with you. Who was invited to come and drink tea as oh. a performance? Who? Uh, like uh, Alex Brotman. Sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there any other? I think Nicola also had a question. Or? I have one. Um, just your relationship to written, the written word and to text. Um, I read for the, the, the gallery catalog a beautiful poetic text by a, a critic. Um, who, who, uh, who wrote for that. I'm wondering, as you've been saying, you haven't been really referring to 
other artists or try not to find inspiration so much from other artists. How about from writers or people from other fields of cultural production? Is there any uh, kind of writing that is important for your creative well, process? I'm sure we're, we're far more well read than most of our contemporary artists, but we really do want to try to feel our living world around us and to feel the pain out in the world as we speak now. All over the world there are people lying in prisons awaiting execution for doing much the same thing as you've all done during this week. So we, we do want to be conscious n not of the other artists or other culture, but of the reality that surrounds us. And we believe that we're all complicit. There's no enemy, there's no, nobody to blame. It's all what we've done. We're all in the same thing. And we, like, we, we think it's important to be responsible. We all know where to go if we break our leg, the hospital. We all know where to go if we're robbed to the police station. But we are still spiritual, human, thinking, feeling people. And that, that you can't get from the hospital or the police station. That is from culture, from reading a book or playing music or going to an exhibition. We believe the force of culture in the world is an enormous, underrated fact of life. But we blame the religion. We only, we only say ban religion and, and decriminalize de sex. sex. But we blame the religions. Okay, next one. Maybe your last question. Last question. Yes. Uh, <coughs> um, so I'm really interested that you talk about your work being so much about kind of feeling and the human condition when, you know, on a visual level, I've always engaged with you two and the way you present yourselves as kind of quite um quite a uh, austere and this kind of um kind of a stiff a stiff British upper lip that stiff kind of characterizes huh? that stiff you into an stiff is fine. Stiff. <laughs> I just wanted to talk if there's any you two is if there's any contrast or if there's any tension between those two things, between the kind of like the meaty abundance of um, emotion in the work and this kind of austere essence very, that you very, present. Very important point <coughs> you brought out. I think if, if, if in 90, when did we show the naked shit pictures? In, <coughs> in 84. In 84. I think 94. The, yeah. 94. I think the reaction to those, or the dirty words pictures when we made them, the reaction to those pictures and the understanding of those pictures would have been quite different if we were scruffy, hippie artists. They would have been taken up in a different way. Because we're normal, polite, people that they're seen differently. I think that's very important. <coughs> a friend of ours, a lady friend, when we had the big Tate Modern exhibition, she took her grandmother, who was a very uh, disgruntled, rather awkward old lady, and she took her to see the exhibition in the hope of arousing some anger or criticism in her. So they went very silently through the whole of the exhibition, and as they left the building, she said to her grandmother, so what do you think, grandmother, about the exhibition? And the grandmother said, well, I don't think I agree entirely with every single picture I've seen, but they do dress very nicely. <laughs> so, so we'd got away with it, you yes. see. Sums it up pretty well. Yeah. Um, no, we don't want to be this scruffy, dressed up uh, hippie artist. We never wanted that. And we have nothing to do with upper class and all this. Stuff. We have just the, what you call the normal suit we want to be dressed. A a a normal. An ordinary person, if you go to try to get a job or if you go to a wedding, you put on a suit. It's as simple as that, yeah. In fact, if you put all the, all the modern suits in a computer and you press normal, they would come the up. The average suit. <laughs> I can see you don't believe it, but so. <laughs> no, we always said that we didn't want to be the artist that the mother would be ashamed of, but I must say it didn't work out exactly like that. <laughs> okay, good. I just thought there was one more person over there who had a question. Okay. Yes. Very simple question. How do you choose what you're going to dress? Sorry? Today? How do you choose your dressing code? Oh, it's very simple. We, we only have white shirts. We don't have to choose that. We have ties in, in pairs. So we, we go to the tailor every three years, probably, to get in some new suits. We, 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 we try not to think about that, really. We have six. We try not to think about it. That's why we don't even like reading menus. Oh. We just go to the same restaurant, have the same food every night, until one night we vomit, then oh. we change the... <laughs> 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 and we have seven pairs of shoes. No, that's it. And thi things we need, like uh, instant coffee, sugar, lavatory paper, toothpaste, we order in sort of two year supplies. <laughs> so we don't have to do any shopping. It leaves, again, it leaves us very free. It probably adds 27 years to our life or something. Yes, we never boiled an egg. No, no cooking? 
No food in the house? No food, no alcohol in the fuck house. Only in the studio. <laughs> Okay, nice one. Would you maybe mind, just by finishing off the, this talk, uh, sliding back in your roles of uh, singing sculptures and maybe bring us a little song? How, how it all started? Oh, yes, by accident he started, <coughs> the singing sculpture. L like all country people, we were and we still are amazed by the cities. London, Paris, Brussels, New York. We are fascinated by the fabric of the creation of the cities for all these people all these horse-drawn, steam-drawn things that created this monster. Extraordinary things, cities filled with their libraries and houses and flats and tubes and undergrounds and shops and cafes and restaurants and hotels and endless variety of activity. And we were walking in London, being fascinated by the fabric of our world, and we came to a housing estate of the utopian style. It was all painted white, it had its own gardens, it was for lower class families, built in the just after the Second World War. And it was so posh that the posts that supported the washing lines had beautiful ceramic birds mounted on the top, especially commissioned by Royal Dalton. So it was, so it was for poor, lower income people, but very, very idealistic. And on the ground floor, there were some retail shops. And <coughs> there was one shop that specialized in the goods that people leave behind when they move house. So it was lampshades, the odd book, just bits and pieces, the, the detritus of our normal life. And we were always fascinated by that, all the things that nobody loved and left behind. And there one day we saw a gramophone record, just one, and we realized that in some strange way it had found us. And we took it home, we found a gramophone to play it on, we wound it up, and it was, it was the words of the song it felt were very much like our own situation. It was like a record about us. I think we should stand for this. Yeah. Here we go. Oh. And it was very simple and very straightforward. And the, the words that came were, the writs I never sigh for, the Carlton they can keep. There's well, only one, one place that I know, and that is where I sleep, underneath the arches. I dream my dreams away Underneath the arches On cobblestones we lay Every night you'll find me Tired out and worn Happy when the daylight Comes creeping Heralding the dawn Sleeping when it's raining And sleeping when it's fine la dee 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 da 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 Pavement is my pillow, no matter where we stray. Underneath the arches, I dream my dreams away. Thank you so much.